Good afternoon. Welcome back to this symposium. Dr. Abu Choi is a research assistant professor in the School of Life Sciences, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her research interests her research interests include reproductive and larval ecology of coral, coral recruitment dynamics, and coral coral restoration using sexually recruit corals. Today, Dr. Abu Choi will present on the topic on degradation and restoration of coral communities in Hong Kong. Dr. Choi, please. All right. So, um, thanks, Chia. So, hi, everyone. My name is Apple. Uh, I'm a research assistant professor from the School of Life Sciences uh, of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to be here to be able to share with you this topic on degradation and restoration of coral communities. And this is actually a case study and a kind of an ex experience sharing from Hong Kong. Now, um, believe it or not, this video is actually taken in Hong Kong. Um, this is not even in our marine protected area. It's actually a site in Shai Kong. And here in Hong Kong, we basically do not have extensive reef structure, as you can see, but we do have corals that usually attach directly onto boulders, bed rocks, and form these scattered coral communities along the coast. Um, as what you see, our coral coverage can also be very good. It can even go up to like 80% coverage in some area. So people usually describe Hong Kong as a marginal coral environment. Um, it basically means that coral communities here are living close to one or more of their survival vessels. Um, for example, uh, corals in Hong Kong, um, they experience very large fluctuation in temperature year round. Winter temperature, it can actually go down to 14 degrees Celsius. And because of the turbidity, of course, this photo, of course, is being taken in one of the best days of the years, which only happens, you know, last for several, several days in a year. But on average, the site actually looked like this. So because of this turbidity, corals are usually found in quite shallow waters. And that's why they are also frequently exposed to salinity fluctuation due to heavy rain or runoff. And because of all these suboptimal conditions um, that um, uh, uh, they are experiencing, the coral population are currently experiencing, they might have already been well adapted or acclimatized to more stressful environment through generation of selection or experience from past exposure. Now, from previous talk, like um, earlier this morning from Professor Chu and Walter, you've already heard a lot about different stress responses to Hong Kong corals. So indeed, there are actually growing evidence suggesting that our corals in Hong Kong might be potentially tolerant to global stressors, such as rising sea surface temperature. And my, uh, for myself, my research actually focused more on the early stages of corals. So here's one of the examples that I'd like to share with you as well. This one is on Platygyra coral, one of the most dominant coral genus in Hong Kong, and we expose the competent coral larvae um, to elevated temperature and also lower salinity and see if it will actually affect the settlement and post-settlement survival. I'm not going to get into details here, but I'd just like to let you know that even up to five degree um, elevated seawater temperature, it did not have any, you know, as you can see, significant effects on both larval settlement and full settlement survival. And this is actually kind of a long-term study. So it lasts for 56 days. So it's kind of like a prolonged exposure as well, which basically the result makes it the most tolerant coral species ever reported in the literature. And um, similar tolerance also applies to other aquifer corals in Hong Kong as well. So overall, they might actually be the ones who can survive global climate change. And if there's, of course, a big if, if it's really true, if it's really the case, then they do have much higher conservation value. In, um, and I really love to collaborate and explore more in this area. Now, very quickly, uh, we'll shift our focus uh, from a more global threats to local stressors, because as you know, over the world, reefs are impacted by bleaching event, which cause a decline in percent coverage. While isle corals, um, if you can again recall earlier from Professor Chu's talk, um, if our coral bleach, um, they do have quite good recovery. Um, however, Hong Kong corals are also under threats 
Okay, and in Hong Kong, it's actually one of those places where coral decline are mostly due to local factors. Okay, uh, like for example, coastal development, pollution, overfishing, etc. Now, um, back in 1980, um, there's two sites called Bush Reef and North Reef, two islands located in this, uh, we call this Tolo Harbor Channel. Um, there has been record of very high coral coverage to up to 70 and 80% coverage. Just, if you can recall, just like the video I just showed you, very high cover, coral coverage. And uh, worth mentioning is that this number is even higher than some of our marine parks nowadays. So what happened um, was due to pollution and sedimentation caused by urbanization, coastal development in surrounding areas, um, the coral coverage just dropped dramatically to, to below to an even zero um, in coverage. So coral was once here, but because of pollution, they were gone. Um, unfortunately, even after our government has put in lots and lots of efforts to improve water quality, the coral just never come back. And it's truly disappointing, but this is the fact. The fact is that um, our data actually shows that the whole coral system was basically damaged beyond repair. Okay, first, there weren't not, not many um, coral, remaining corals to grow through asexual production. And secondly, there is just very low coral recruitment coming from replenishing from um, sexual coral reproduction. So the lesson learned here is that um, coral communities could so easily be destroyed um, and yet the natural recovery can be so difficult and even unlikely like in this case. So now with the improvement of water quality, we decided that perhaps it's time for us to do something about it. And that's where we come we, we came in. I'm not sure if you've been here before. So this is our marine lab, marine science laboratory in CHK. What we do here in the lab is that we, we actually culture corals for restoration studies. And um, to be honest, coral restoration is still in its infancy in both China and in Hong Kong. And most of the studies we have so far uh, that have used, we have used um, asexual fragments only. Uh, because simply because it's easier, um, these so called, this is also so called the asexually propagated corals. These asexually propagated corals, they're actually broken portion of a coral colony in the field. So these coral fragments, um, once they're broken, we collect them. People actually give this um, fragments a very beautiful name that is the corals of opportunity, meaning that if you don't save them, they may probably die in the natural environment. So uh, me and my team will go out and collect them. We then further fragment them into smaller pieces because sometimes when we bring it back to the lab, it's really large um, or it, 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 it's not that healthy, like um, the, the whole fragment. So sometimes we'll further fragment them into smaller pieces and then we'll grow them in our coral nursery, allow them to recover. And eventually we'll take them out um, to outline onto our previously degraded sites, our target restoration sites. Um, so this is some of our ongoing project in Tolo Channel, um, the Bush Reef and Not Reef, and of course it's one of the uh, site, the picture in one of the site. And we actually have different species outplanted. And after two years, uh, we actually re re achieve a uh, around 90% of survival, which is really a very good number in terms of the survival up to our planting. And as for the growth, um, these are two very quick example. We have um, five genus outline actually. So these are two quick example. Um, this picture actually shows you that after a year, you can see that the corals in general, they grow very well, especially for this branch form, a copra coral. Um, it's really amazing because it's like, it gave us like almost 20 fold um, uh, increase in size per year for this aquapra coral, roughly eight centimeters uh, in diameter. And of course, uh, we also um, have other corals out plant, like this platygyra coral, a massive form one, um, uh, around one fold per year, roughly two centimeters in diameter per year of growth. Um, 
which is as expected because different grow form, their growth are kind of different. Um, so with our core out plants, uh, we can already begin to see them being able to bring in a bit of fowl diversity. You see, um, there are seahorse, butterfly fish uh, comes in and, um, and live around or, uh, or use our coral as their anchor. Okay, live around corals. So all these actually indicate that, um, you know, once the problem is solved, I mean, the problem of degradation is solved, say water quality is improved, there's actually great potential for restoration. Um, and of course, in this case, branching corals are really a great starting point because they grow really, really fast. Great candidate for restoration. But of course, when we talk about restoration in general, we need also to put in efforts to restore other massive foreign corals as well. Uh, so on top of that, uh, with the technique in uh, larval culturing, my team also do massive coral culturing using sexually propagated uh, propagation approach for restoration in Hong Kong. So um, the approach is actually involves the collection of gametes uh, from coral during spawning. We culture them into larvae, settle them as baby corals on the substrate that we provide. So these baby corals, uh, we then cap them in our land-based nursery, and then we outplant them to the field at a much larger size for, for uh, restoration. It has to be at larger size because um, in Hong Kong, we already have studies showing that coral recruitment itself in Hong Kong in general is very, very low, both on sediment tiles and on natural sub substratum. So one of the major problems we have nowadays is um, low post sediment survival of recruits in the field. Uh, basically, if you just outplant them in very, very early stage, after a month or three months, all of them will be gone. Okay, so which basically means that if we try to use direct seeding of mass cultured coral larvae on natural substrate, it seems uh, not quite possible in Hong Kong, but we like to give it a try, but uh, it may not be very promising. And this actually reveals a huge problem uh, if we try to use sexual propagation approach for restoration. So I've listed some of the uh, major challenges here. Uh, for example, in our waters, marginal environment, uh, we have kind of very high sediment um, year round and also in some sites, there are actually very intense competition of space with other benthos, uh, for example, those fouling organisms like oysters, barnacles, brolsorns, algae. And, um, and coral being slow growth is one very major problem contributing to the local Saturn survival. Uh, for example, this one is a four-year-old juvenile corals, a copra species. Um, we grow them from baby corals in the field. So we know that it's four years old already, um, but it's four years and it's still uh, only eight centimeters in diameter. So it actually indicates that these corals just grow very, very slowly. And that's uh, one of the problem we face in Hong Kong when we, uh, when we talk about restoration. So, um, and of course, when they grow that slowly, um, other organisms come in and they will easily um, overgrow um, the corals, outcompete the coral. So marginal coral environment in general will have all these limitation challenges make our restoration even more challenging than it already is. So you can see or imagine life is really hard for a little coral recruit in general in the field. So in order for the whole idea of sexual propagation approach to work, we actually have to grow them to a much larger size before we do any outplanting. And I'll give you an example like this one. Uh, these little ones, we have, um, we actually have been culturing them in our lab nursery for two years. And it around two to three uh, centimeters in diameter. And in 2019, we have our first ever outplanting of these two year old sexually propagated juvenile corals in Tolo channel for restoration purpose. We were like gambling, you know, uh, like show hand. Um, it either work or it doesn't, <laughs> so it's kind of risky. But thankfully, the result is actually quite promising. We achieved 95% of survival in the first year. So the hard work kind of pay off. And they are growing quite well as well. So this um, species is a, a copra brunosa. 
And we basically, we know that the sexual technique is going to work in Hong Kong because we already have example of successful outline of corals being reproductively, reproductive viable in the field. It took us five years for, uh, for this uh, copra to meet our corals, but still it's possible. So now what we need to do is a bit of out, upscaling, and this is what we're trying to do in future. So now just, just a quick summary in here. People use a sexual and uh, sexual coral propagation approach. So, a sexual coral uh, reproduction for restoration. This technique has proven to be quite successful in Hong Kong so far because survival is quite good and it's very easy to um, to get these fragments. Just go out and collect them. Fra um, the fragment size is much larger to begin with. So that's why the survival in general is better. However, there's also problem. Um, associate with uh, these um, technique, asexual propagation techniques. First is the source is limited because it actually rely a lot or it depends on the existing coral colonies to provide these kind of natural coral fragments. So it seems not to be a very, very long lasting solution if we want a lot of growth source for our planting. And we also have to be aware of the genetic diversity. For example, if we uh, collect coral, fragment, we break the coral fragment into smaller pieces. Um, although it looks like if it looks as if we have lots of corals for our planting, but they're actually close to each other, which means that they genetically they're actually the same. Meaning that if one of them die due to unfavorable environment, um, probably all of them will die at the same time because they are clone to each other, they are the same. So this is where sexual coral reproduction comes in. Um, you know, um, unlike those from fragments, uh, baby corals from sexual reproduction, we, 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 we mix the gametes from all parents together in the very first place to create as much diversity as possible. So they're more genetically diverse and because, because simply because every single individual um, are different in their genetic makeup. So hopefully they are even more adaptable to environmental change than those create from fragments only. So this is very important because we want our coral out plant to not only survive just now, but also in the future. And we know that the environment is changing and we just, we hope um, by enhancing the biodiversity, we, we just let our mother nature to determine which one to survive in future. So our ultimate goal, of course, is not only to restore the coral, but the whole ecosystem. So this is just a beginning. Uh, the best approach, of course, is to use both at the same time. All right, so um, I'm just going to close by saying that Hong Kong, you know, uh, Hong Kong is a very interesting place for coral research. It's a marginal coral environment. Um, these corals, they may have enormous potential for expanding our knowledge and understanding of the limits of cor for coral adaptation or acclimation in this you know, era of global climate change. Um, however, the most immediate threats for us, for our corals are local stressors, uh, coastal development, pollution, sedimentation, overfishing. So restoration is a long-term process, you know, it's not a very quick fix. And of course we should always, I think the rule of thumbs is always, we try to prevent damage occurring in the first place because it's much less expensive to protect reefs or mitigate impacts than to try to do all sorts of attempts to restore damage to ones. And it's also not a guaranteed success as well after all. And here our ultimate goal is to help our coral survive um, changing climate. Um, and with that, we're trying to do, or our lab, my team is trying to do our future five-year plan is actually, we continue to uh, optimize techniques for using sexually propagated corals for restoration um, for marginal environments. Say we have to um, optimize on, you know, how to minimize the post sediment mortality, develop methods for upscaling in a more cost-effective way. Um, we also aim to enhance the resilience of coral stock, you know, integrate more proactive approach to ensure long-term viability of restored corals in this changing climate, such as, for example, there are lots of inter, um, in initiatives happening um, or being proposed, such as uh, identifying resilient corals, managed selection, 
breeding, chimerism, a lot of different strategies. And finally, my team, of course, we do a lot of uh, uh, community outreach in Hong Kong, trying to raise more uh, community awareness um, in this issue as well. So with that, we aim to develop um, a coral restoration protocol that would be applicable not just in Hong Kong and also with a much wider application, such as restoring coral communities in other parts of uh, southern China as well. So uh, finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Put An, my former supervisor, also my lifelong mentor, and all members from my lab. So because all these um, definitely it's a team effort. It wouldn't have been possible without all the support and assistance. And of course, um, I also like to thank uh, uh, the below funding support that I received from AFCD and also the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation. Yep, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Abu Choi. We are so happy to have you here in Hong Kong working on coral restoration, wonderful research and conservation effort. We have received two questions from the audience from the Philippines. The first question is asking which species you have used for sexual propagation. Yeah. The second question is how are the growth rate compared between the sexual and asexual out plant? Mm, okay. Um, thanks a lot for the questions. I really welcome this kind of uh, sharing knowledge exchange. I really want to uh, you know, know more about um, the reefs uh, restoration happening elsewhere as well. So in my case, uh, the Sexual reproduction, uh, because um, of the manpower, you know, there are a lot of limitation um, in the very first place. So right now, up till now, we are able to um, work on three different coral species. Uh, one is uh, Platygyra, but they, were, they, they just grow so slowly. So uh, we still are working on the Platygyra coral because it's the most dominant coral uh, species we have in Hong Kong. But at the same time, we also explore the Acorpora because they just grow much, much faster, give us higher survival. Um, so um, I, so far I've been working on two Acropora species as well, together with the Platygyra, that is the Acropora uh, Prenosa and Tumita. Yeah, so these are mainly the three coral species. Um, we we're ex actually exploring to see if we can uh, try um, or explore to work on more coral species uh, in the future. Yeah. And as for the second question is about the coral growth, uh, comparing the fragments and the um, uh, those baby corals from sexual from sexual reproduction. I would say um, what really surprised me is the growth. I'll, I'll, I'll give I will uh, go back to the slide showing the growth of uh, asexual fragments, because in general, we know that Hong Kong is not an optimal environment for coral growth. So um, we will think that um, the growth rate would be um, uh, uh, in general slower than when we compare it to the tropics. And I think that's true. But in this case, what really amazed us is the growth of these acopera fragment. Just one year time, 20 fold in size change. But I think um, we have to be careful when we interpret this kind of growth because uh, those are very uh, are kind of small fragments and and you know nowadays people always talk about even micro fragmentation as well because we tend to think that if they're small they tend not to um, devote that energy into um, sexual reproduction so so perhaps it's one of the reason why they have their all their energy for asexual reproduction. So that's why they grow much faster. So I think we have to be a little bit um, careful when we interpret this kind of early growth, early outplant, early growth, because their size is really small. So perhaps once they reach sexual um, stage, their growth will not be that quick, you know, uh, in marginal environment. And in general, um, uh, if we measure our adult coral growth outside the field, is it's not that quick, actually, to be honest. And as for the uh, juvenile corals, um, um, this one, this is, um, I would say in general, uh, of course, a copra coral is the fastest growing coral species. In Hong Kong, this one is like, if we grow it from baby corals, it would be like two centimeters per year. Yeah. So um, it's not really, really fast, but um, it's still the fastest one so far. So thanks again for the questions and I really uh, will welcome more, um, perhaps save it to later discussion or you can feel free to email me actually. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Abu Choi. The next speaker is Dr. Rajan. Raj, Dr. Rajan should be here with us. 
Would you please upload your PowerPoint slide? Yeah, I will do it. Today, Dr. Rajan will share with us his important findings about the Chinese oyster and their responses to ocean acidification. Dr. Rajan, please. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, hi, you all hear me? Hello? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah, I do. Okay, great. Um, thanks uh, for um, this the great opportunity. Sorry for uh, for mixing up with the timing. Um, and also thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk in later time slot today. Um, very nice. Enjoyed the, the talks so far. Thanks for all of you staying this long and this uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, so I'm going to be a relatively um, uh, giving you a, a relatively uh, simple talk and give you a rather a story instead of more technical uh, data and the talks uh, 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 like that. Um, so basically, I'm a Rajan. I work uh, from Hong Kong U um, and also work in the Soar Institute of uh, Marine Science. And uh, many of uh, uh, participants in this meeting probably may aware. Um, of this institute and my work in oysters is so probably I'll, I'll, I'll give you a story about it. Um, so that's what um, we have a brand new um, marine institute now you see the picture and also we have um, a set up recently um, Hong Kong oyster hatchery and in the innovation um, uh, innovation research unit and, uh, um, and we'll be talking on some of those things. So the three uh, points I'm going to share with you today and discuss with you um, in this uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, the first point about aquaculture and particularly oyster aquaculture um, in Southern China, uh, more focused on Southern China than um, in other part of the China. So oyster aquaculture in Southern China, that's the first point. And second thing, um, I will tell you what are the challenges, problems that oysters in Southern China are facing due to various um, anthropogenic stressors, including climate change, and then who will be some sort of winner and loser under this scenario. Um, so how to identify the winner? Because aquaculture is all about uh, winners. They don't uh, care much about the losers. Um, so, so we um, we try to um, uh, I try to tell you how we could identify those winners under this scenario, and then what is um, how to use those winners for uh, sustainable aquaculture in later on. That's the third part. Um, so, so it's, those are three points I will be um, uh, talking today with you and uh, to discuss with you. Um, oysters, I think many of you are very very familiar, um, and uh, particularly. Um, uh, Professor Wu here, um, he has uh, pioneered the work in Hong Kong um, few, many years ago, um, intensively worked on aquaculture um, in La Fusan, the deep bay area, and uh, figured out that the problems that the species is facing in this region and things like that. But nevertheless, many of you still love oysters, including Hong Kong oysters, including those cultivated in the deep bay. And they are all very happy because we, um, uh, uh, we, we, we cook them in a multiple ways and a typical Chinese way in, the, in the multiple cuisines. So they are they are great. Remember, um, oysters is omega rich, um, relatively um, less cholesterol, huge protein turnover, and it's an amazing food in that respect. So oyster aquaculture is is uh, no doubt is the uh, number one seafood in this region. Um, in terms of in many other things. And also I think many of you uh, maybe remember, maybe um, um, uh, know, or if not, uh, this would be interesting information to all of you. Um, although um, uh, ice aquaculture is, ice trees are cultivated around the world, um, over 80% of ice trees, uh, aquaculture ice trees is, is, uh, comes from China, which is huge. Um, which is a huge in terms of the thing. And among those 80, 90% the cultivated species in China, there are three species that are uh, predominant. Uh, the number one contributor for this production is uh, uh, sea ungulata, we call the Portuguese oysters. Oh, Professor Yu, hello, you all hear me? Yes, I do, we will yeah, hear yeah. you. Okay, okay, yeah, because I saw Professor Wu was trying to say something, so. Um, so um, that's fine. 
uh, let me continue. Um, so the Portuguese oil stress is, uh, um, it's really um, the number one, which is cultivated in uh, Taiwan and Xiamen and in the middle part of China. And then if you come down further, um, you see uh, an, another major species, which is called the Hong Kong oyster, um, which is also um, another uh, second most uh, contributing species. It's cultivated from all the way in all Guangdong province um, um, in this region and all the way to Hainan Island. The Pacific oyster, which is well known to many of you and in the, in the cultivated globally, because it's invaded in other parts of the world for commercial purpose, is mostly cultivated in northern part of China, which is the third player, major player um, among the three species. Um, so this is, this is how the scenario is. So, so the Portuguese oyster is the number one, Hong Kong oyster is the number two. These two oysters together contributing almost 60% of the global oyster production. So this is a huge, and significantly important for one. And among these two species, the Hong Kong oyster is uh, somehow um, uh, is cultivated mostly by the local growers, indigenous industry um, in Southern China compared to the Portuguese oysters. If you go to Xiamen, if you go to the other side, it's relatively rich oyster growers and more industries involved in the cultivation of the Portuguese oysters. Um, and, and, and Hong Kong oyster is still controlled by local growers and, uh, and the more indigenous uh, growers and things. But compared to these two species, Portuguese oyster and Hong Kong oyster, Hong Kong oyster is relatively rich in omega-3 natural antioxidants, high protein. We now we have a lots of data coming up between these two species. Um, so we have set up a food, uh, um, a food quality analysis um, uh, testing facility also. This is all the data is clearly telling us this Hong Kong oyster is rich and taste wise and is a super great um, in terms of that. But these two oysters in generally um, in Southern China um, are facing um, several problems uh, in recent times, in particularly in the past uh, uh, five to six years. Um, in these years, at least I'm involved with this industry and, uh, and, uh, and I, I come across all these things. Um, there are eight uh, um, 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 problems they are facing now, but I'm not going to talk about all of them. And particularly at the number seven, uh, which is very relevant, very interesting uh, to this meeting as well, um, is the climate change. Again, climate change is very, very well known to every one of you, um, and nothing super um, new in this case. But what is interesting here, the climate change, what I mean mostly nowadays, is the changing in the, in the seasonality. So, you know, the winter is, is, is the winter is the perfect golden time for oyster aquaculture, where they are not developing gonads, putting all their energy for the meat, and the growers harvest during the Chinese New Year, that's the winter time. And so this is, the, the winter time is a critical time for aquaculture, um, oyster aquaculture. And this winter time, because of the climate change is either shrinken or it's much warmer winter. This is what the scenario is in the first few years. So in the warmer winter, what's happening, oysters started reproducing much earlier than it's supposed to be. They're supposed to reproduce in the, in the late in March, April, uh, May, but they have started reproducing, developing gonads in, in February. So just, uh, just at the time of their harvesting, that's killing oysters. When they started reproducing in the winter time, um, in, in a, it's an unusual period. There's, they are experiencing unusual pathogens, I guess, then their mortality is huge and almost 80, 90% of oysters in Southern China die before the har growers harvest them. This is, this is, we call winter mortality, which is the major issue now, um, this whole Southern China aquaculture um, uh, people are facing. So we need uh, uh, to work on these issues. We need some innovation to sustain this oyster aquaculture. That's the two point I'm going to talk in the later um, on the slides. Um, so it's the winter mortality is not about just uh, the dying of oysters in the winter time, because the aquaculture in southern China also depend on those oysters, natural wild oysters and the, and the seeds that produced by the wild oysters. If 90% die, you can't, you can't get the enough seed from the wild. That's the issue as well. We don't have much hatcheries, oyster hatcheries in the entire southern China to supply for the whole aquaculture industry. It's coming up now, but it's not enough yet. So the healthy seed production is also a question mark here because oysters dying in the winter condition are they are not healthy 
If they are not healthy, if they are dying, they may not be producing healthy seeds for the next generation. These are the two issues. They are dying and they are not producing healthy wild seeds. If these two things are happening, if the oysters is dying, if and probably the food safety and the food quality also matters because they are struggling. They're struggling to survive. So you can't expect them to have a very tasty oysters with uh, plenty of glycogen, um, which is question mark. So the quality matters, quantity um, is seriously affected um, and, uh, and the healthy seed production for the next generation is also affected. So these are all the issues I, I assume this Southern Chinese oyster aquaculture people going to face in next few years time if climate change is continues to um, 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 affect this industry. And so we have to um, find a solution for this thing. This is an um, uh, oyster aquaculture uh, area in southern China, with where I go uh, very frequently do the experiment. You see here the growers keep telling me 90% gone, 100% gone, um, completely disappears in the February, um, March, April time before they harvest. So this is um, uh, this is a is a big issue um, uh, in mortality. Um, all these are happening. So why this is happening? Um, again, I'm not uh, uh, only one looking at this problem. There is uh, my colleague. Uh, uh, my good friend, Professor Sini Yu from, Guan, um, uh, from Guangzhou, um, is, has been working in this field for 10, 20 years of time. Um, it's hard to figure it out why they are dying uh, in winter time, at least in recent times. Um, so, um, but as I um, explained to you before, is obviously they have started reproducing earlier in time. Temperature is um, much higher in warmer winter areas in winter time then it's a pathogens attacking them and killing them. We have to verify this hypothesis, but very likely this, this is, is in, uh, uh, likely this is uh, going to be the scenario. But at the same time, there's another issue is happening. Um, oyster aquaculture, particularly the Hong Kong oyster, compared to the Portuguese oyster. I always be comparing these two species, okay? The Portuguese oyster, more coastal species, live in a high salinity areas. Hong Kong oysters live in estuarine areas, low salinity areas. So there is a drastic difference between these two species in terms of their uh, survival skills. So the Hong Kong oyster, since there is no space for the cultivation in the estuarine areas in the entire South China, is all well developed. So aquaculture people go, try to go a little bit far away from the estuarine areas to more coastal areas. Coastal areas is a high salinity areas. So these species is die there. Uh, but they don't have option, they have to go. So, so they're trying to push it in that way. That's the one issue that they're facing. At the same time, when you go to the more coastal areas, the coastal areas is, uh, is in the winter time is much lower pH. So it's anthropogenic pH, we can call as acidification, either ocean acidification or acidification, whatever the reason, the pH is lower in the coastal areas where this species is now cultivated intensively. So these species are experiencing this um, acidification, um, low pH scenarios quite often than ever before. Um, so that's how the things that are happening is there. So now the pH is declining uh, because, you know, they are cultivating an offshore area and then is the uh, 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 warmer uh, temperature in the winter conditions. So who will be the winner and loser under this scenario? So either an oyster is going to adapt within few generations to tackle this um, warmer winter and also at the same time, their lower pH at the same time. That is the biggest question we are asking now um, um, and, and, and in this field. Um, again, I think many of you, I'll be going through quickly these slides because it's more, uh, more technical, um, but the species adapt to the new environmental condition on any species um, in two different ways. Um, one is acclimation using existing genome, existing genetics, existing power, they just plasticity, plastic. They try to adapt to this condition um, using um, uh, acclimation, we call acclimation. Um, um, and then another one is the genetic adaptation, uh, changes in the gene. So genetic adaptation is not possible in a shorter period of time, so forget about it. So only the acclimation is possible. So the acclimation um, is, it is just a, a natural acclimation using existing genes without much involvement in the environment um, and if the acclimation happens only within the generation, it's not much helpful. Uh, but if the acclimation what is, 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 is translated into the genes somehow, 
and then that acclimation capacity translated or adapted uh, 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 are, are imprinted in the genome and that information translated, transferred to the next generation, the next generation will be much better in survival skills under the same scenario. Um, this is called, we call epigenetic inheritance. So this is possible um, in many human species or in many higher animals because the genome is highly methylated. 70% of the genome, they have a methylation mark um, and it's possible. Environment influence the genome and then it's, trans it's inherited to the next generation. Now we have uh, uh, done enough work with me and my colleagues and including uh, Gen 1 here, have been intensively working in this area. It's brand new area, epigenetics. So environment, um, like, for example, the warmer winter, a low pH environment, telling or uh, changing the DNA methylation patterns um, and as a part of adaptation, as a part of acclimation capacity. And then this is inherited to the next generation. If that happened, the next generation offsprings may have much, much better chance to survive under similar um, warmer winter and lower pH environment. If this continues for a few more generations, then this particular population may have a higher adaptive capacity to live in this altered environmental condition compared to others because it's dictated, it's uh, in, uh, dictated by epigenetic mechanism, um, which, is, which is what we are looking forward. If this is there in a particular species, in a particular population, then we have a high confidence of using this particular population for aquaculture um, to tackle this issue. That's the whole core idea of the next few slides I'm going to talk to you. I hope it's clear to um, um, uh, many of you. So we have been working in this area for the past two, three years intensively, thanks to two of our graduate students, uh, Kanmani and uh, James. Um, so they have done uh, an enormous number of works in this species, um, in both the species, and particularly the Hong Kong oysters. So um, basically, I'm not going to explain this slide. They're looking at, they're cultivating these oysters under natural conditions with various stresses, also under laboratory conditions. And then they take the genome or uh, DNA of these animals and see whether there is any changes um, in the DNA by, uh, by epigenetic mechanisms, so particularly methylation pattern, and how, how well these changes translated, um, transferred into the next generation. And then this, changed DNA is persistent in nature, um, how far is persistent, and whether they have any added advantage uh, because of this changed DNA uh, methylation patterns in aquaculture site. So this is what um, um, we have been looking for and the working on different stress response pathways and particularly. But one thing is, uh, um, is clear so far, um, this biomineralization pattern, stress response pattern, it's uh, in the Hong Kong oysters in particular, um, is very well adapted, acclimated. And those acclimations is the driven by DNA methylation pattern. As you see here, the number of genes that's altered by methylation patterns in response to a warmer winter or low pH conditions is you see here, there are a huge number, um, huge number of uh, hypermethylated genes. And this genes is giving a power for these oysters to survive under this condition. And also now we, um, we, uh, we, we have shown that this number of genes, the methylated genes is translated, the offspring. So offspring is also doing much better um, under these scenarios, um, other conditions. So the, the major conclusion I mean, um, uh, in a large number of the studies is basically um, a Hong Kong oyster in a particular population, not all the population, uh, we can't uh, that way. A population that we have been using for our studies is uh, this looks like well adapted to survive under low pH conditions in particular because their genes, their genome is capable of um, uh, uh, take, um, uh, capable of learning from environment through DNA methylation patterns and that methylation pattern is persistent. Uh, transferred to the offspring. So that mechanism exists in these species and that helped them to survive um, a quite, um, a quite well. And particularly the biomineralization mechanisms. That's what is we are interested in. Uh, when the pH is lower, I think many of you are well aware the pH is related to the biomineralization uh, pattern um, of, uh, of the species because the resources. So this particular mechanism is more 
um, uh, uh, more capable of acclimating um, through epigenetic mechanisms. So this is the good news in terms of uh, Hong Kong oysters um, with the things. Um, now we have been working with uh, Lee Kum Gay as an industry. Um, remember, aquaculture is a big field. It's an impossible to do this work in the laboratory for a longer period of time. So we have been working with the uh, uh, Lee Kum Gay um, uh, uh, company. Uh, they have big oyster farms and, and so several oyster hatcheries as well. So we have been um, doing this experiment in, um, in, um, in, in collaboration with the industry um, quite successfully for many years now. Um, so that helps us to do the things. So the next important question, we, we see these Hong Kong oysters in the laboratory conditions they are capable of adapting to this um, uh, environmental stresses uh, within the generation and also this uh, adapted mechanism is transferred to the offspring. This is true. But what is happened, whether this offspring can retain or persist with this adapted mechanism in nature, then we, trans, uh, we, we outplanted these offspring into different aquaculture sites in Southern China. You can see site one, site two, site three. And then we looked at you know, how they perform in, in, in the wild aquaculture conditions. Um, again, the gems did a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of work and we have clearly seen a positive carryover effect. These this individuals with this adapted genome, adapted methylation parents, and they have a good capability in the laboratory condition. And then we put them in the field and they're doing much better compared to their counterparts, which they, um, you know, there's compared to control and all other things. You can see here, this, the, the, uh, the, the 7.4, 7.4 individuals that's with the acclimated mechanism. So acclimated methylated mechanisms, um, they're doing much better in the field conditions, which is uh, really, really good. Um, in terms of many things, in terms of, but they're so far, they're not highly tolerable to the winter mortality yet. We, we're still waiting for a few more years to uh, confirm this pattern, whether it's going to happen or not, but that's what um, the scenario is. So I hope this is very clear to you, the Hong Kong oyster situation. But there is an, another interesting species, Portuguese oyster, which I compared with, uh, with you all. Uh, just give me two, three minutes, I'll be done. Um, it's, uh, it's another interesting species. Um, this Portuguese oyster, I told you, is a more a high salinity species. Um, it's the number one producer of aquaculture um, uh, meat in, in, in the entire world. Um, as you see here, this species, uh, compared to Hong Kong oyster, is more vulnerable uh, because it's a, it's a coastal species. Um, they grow much slower under low pH conditions. Um, um, we don't, they, this species is not suffering winter mortality, so forget about that. They are fine so far. Um, but uh, they are suffering uh, because of the, the, the other anthropogenic condition, particularly hypoxia and the OA, this combination, all these things. So um, we have been interested only with the OA with respect to these species. So if you see here, they are definitely, if you reduce the pH even very small amount, uh, 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 this species is definitely suffering more on the shells is impaired. Uh, which we have shown uh, many years ago. But what we see here now, as uh, Professor Wu has found many years ago with respect to hypoxia, um, which is same thing, sex change. Um, you see the sex ratio is dramatically changed in this species, um, um, which is very interesting now um, to us, um, um, how they change the sex and uh, whether these have any implications, uh, which is again, uh, yeah, I see uh, it's, 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 it's really, now I'm reading more uh, Professor Wu's past papers to see you know, how he looked at uh, with respect to hypoxia and all these things. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, we never know, uh, knew that OEA can change sex. Um, which is which is very exciting. Um, we'll be again um, looking at this is our hot topic now. Um, we'll be very interested um, working in this particular species. So the last message: um, how to select this species for aquaculture? We know now this epigenetic mechanism, all these things is interesting, is fine. But aquaculture industry is is expecting uh, to speed up this selective breeding process using the knowledge we have gained. Uh, they don't have time to wait for three years, five years, 10 years for the natural selective breeding mechanisms to work. So um, now we are um, uh, working with the big data machine learning. Um, I also indicated to uh, James, I'll be meeting next week um, to talk about more on these things. So we have to use this artificial intelligence, big data for fast to speed up the selective uh, 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 breeding mechanisms uh, to help our aquaculture ice species. But we are very highly hopeful of doing that. 
in uh, coming few years uh, uh, because we uh, Lithium Gay Company, which is a huge supporter for us, uh, not only providing uh, their technical support and other things, they are they are giving us gave us multi million dollars to to look at these problems. And a big thanks to uh, Lithium Gay and all my colleagues. I haven't uh, shown them, and most importantly, the students who worked have been intensively working in this area for us and, uh, and all, the, um, all the colleagues, uh, Kenny Lang um, and many others in the group as well, and Jen Van, all these things. So thank you very much uh, to all of you for listening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajan, for the beautiful talk. Any question from the floor, please? If not, I would like to ask a very quick question. As yeah. you have pointed out, and as Professor Wudabu is here too, I would like to ask a question about hypoxia. Our colleague hypoxia is common in the S3 where oyster coexist. Would you please provide your insight into the potential combined impact of hypoxia and ocean acidification on oyster aquaculture? Yeah, excellent uh, question, James. It's uh, definitely excellent question. Um, even when we uh, see the big uh, change in the sex ratio, I thought it's Professor Wu is coming back again uh, with the same his hypoxia trick. Um, it is definitely true. Um, uh, uh, hypoxia is exacerbating OA situation, which has been very well uh, established now, even in the Hong Kong waters. If the hypoxia is, is, is magnifying the effect of OA physically as well as biologically. Um, but luckily so far, this oyster seems not cultivated uh, very much in a low uh, hypo I mean, hypoxic waters. Uh, because it will affect their growth. So I don't see, they, their growers try to move away from hypoxic areas. Um, so so um, I don't think so these two factors will uh, combinedly affect severely aquaculture of these species. But naturally some populations experience these two. That's a more wild population. But aquaculture populations often goes to the more coastal areas where hypoxia is often, is not a big factor. Um, so I hope these two factors won't be uh, interacting and affecting aquaculture. Um, uh, yeah, Genwen uh, asked another question. Um, uh, oysters are uh, uh, protundry. Yes, the Genwen is 100% true. Um, uh, thanks for this question. Oysters is an interesting sexual change mechanisms, unlike many other species. So they born, I mean, they, the first year they as a newborn uh, individuals, they try to be a male, 90% of the male. Um, and then the second year, they change it to female, same individuals. Um, and the third year, uh, they continue uh, as a female. And the fourth year, they become a male. This is a scenario. Um, but what we see here um, under um, uh, OEA condition, 90% in the first year become female, um, which is, I think, is just preliminary results. We have been uh, doing a lot of work now, um, uncertain at this moment. Um, uh, Hong Kong species is that's what we have observed. Uh, oh, sorry, Hong Kong species is uh, maybe different. We don't know yet, but what we have seen is only the Portuguese oyster. The Portuguese oyster is easy to work because they breed within six months, quite fast breeding um, uh, species compared to Hong Kong oysters. Good question. No idea, gentlemen, for Hong Kong oysters, um, but they they born as a male. Yes, you are right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rajan. The next session will be chaired by Professor Kenneth Leung. Professor Kenneth Leung, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you James, uh, for wonderful chairmanship. So now I would like to introduce you the next speaker, uh, Dr. Sa Ying Sen. Uh, she is our newly appointed research assistant professor at State Key Laboratory of Marine Pollution uh, at City University of Hong Kong. Uh, she came from uh, Canada, uh, where she did her postdoc on uh, algal uh, ecotoxicology. Uh, her main research uh, focus uh, quite diverse, including ecotoxicology, environmental risk assessment, emerging chemicals of concern, climate change impact, and uh, water and wastewater treatment. So today she will share her latest discovery on emerging chemicals of concern, stress in microalgae, uh, sighing peace. Over to you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm happy to give the presentation today. And my topic is about the 
uh, the toxicity of emerging contaminants on algae. And there are many con emerging contaminants in the world. So my focus is on care products, PPCPs for short. The reason I want to study uh, PPCPs is it's, uh, they are uh, commonly used by humans and animals. After use, they will enter the wastewater treatment plant through drainage system. But uh, most of them have not been regulated properly. And also because of the limited removal technology, uh, most of them will enter the environment. And if they enter the environment, they may just uh, have some uncertain effects and also cause unexpected problem for the living organisms in the water. Then um, my work is to study how those uh, emerging contaminants affect the living organisms in water. But now I just uh, use algae as a model sample, as a model, biological model. The reason I want to study algae is, is very important to the whole ecosystem. It's the link between the living organisms and the non-living things. Because, for example, uh, algae may uh, absorb carbon dioxide and water and convert them into energy and uh, carbohydrates to feed themselves. And at the same time, algae may produce oxygen for other organisms to consume. And as primary producers, algae could be considered as food to feed other higher trophic level organisms. And algae can produce many uh, value added products such as biodiesel, food pharmaceutic uh, pharmaceuticals for industry use and human use. Then if there is something wrong with the algae that may seriously affect the whole ecosystem. But to be honest, the algae is not that weak because algae is the earliest, earliest form of life on earth. And no matter how many years pass and no matter how many disasters the earth went through, algae still lives well in the water and in the air and also in the, in the soil. So algae is not that weak as we imagine. Then I just want to figure out how those emerging contaminants would uh, affect the algae. Are they safe or not? Then, I'll give a specific topic to solve the problem. And um, it's the long-term impact of a pause di disturbance of triclosan. And I used a different algal species to do the test. Uh, triclosan is a kind of antimicrobial and it has been containing many products such as uh, soap, toothpaste, and body wash. You may use it almost every day. Uh, but triclosan is used to kill bacteria, but if they if it enter the environment, if it will target some non non target organisms like algae, zooplankton, and fish, that that's a problem. But many people study that. Uh, but still, there are some problems unsolved. Like I want to do this study because many. Uh, different countries have different attitudes towards triclosan application, like the United States, European Union, Japan, and Australia, they have negative attitude towards triclosan. They thought uh, triclosan may target uh, multiple to harm the human health. But for Canada, they have a positive attitude towards triclosan, and they don't think Triclosan would cause that serious problem. But I just don't want uh, would cause adverse effects when it enters the environment. And I just uh, use algae as the test model. In reality, um, triclosan would stay in an environment in days or months. So I just did choose a longer exposure time, like the longest time is 29 days. And I used a multiple algal species because some people just use model species and I, and I also add some other species and want to compare their sensitivity. And the last one is I used environmentally relevant concentrations. I just want to mimic the real situation. And those are the uh, spe algal species I used, they, they, there are five species and CPCC 12 and CPCC 2 for 3, they are the uh, algal model, but they are very small, just to have 10 micrometers in diameter. 
and for CPCC12, it has uh, it has no cell wall. The other uh, algal have the other algae have larger size, and for chlorococcum species, it's a colonial cell, and that means the cells are love to grow together. And for Eviridis, it is the largest one I used. Uh, it has size as large as what we're seeing diameter. And for the triclo concentrations, which is a not a massive evaluation, then I used multiple anion points, such as cell density, cell viability, pH, chlorophyll pigment concentration, and chlorophyll fluorescence, as well as uh, biochemical coloration. Those information can be just to use synchrotron light, not the normal light source. So what is a synchrotron? I just want to give you a brief introduction. It's size as large as a football field. It can accelerate electrons to almost the speed of light. So you can see the light speed is very fast. And more so, um, it, it has very high purity. That means uh, because it has very high vacuum to make it has a very high purity and has very high brightness. That would make uh, it can get a, a very higher resolution and a higher signal to noise ratios to make the results more accurate. And, and uh, we have a lot of, it has a lot of magnets around a circle that uh, the magnets are used to change the light directions. When the light directions change, uh, there are excess energy to go through the tunnel light to reach many workstations. Then I'm sorry, there's some uh, technical problem uh, with the connection. Uh, she will join us again. Uh, we are welcome. Uh, any comments oh, or questions? Sorry. Yeah. Hello, can you can you hear me? Yes, uh, welcome. Hello? Uh, perhaps since oh, your Wi-Fi connection really weak, maybe you can shut. Uh, you can close your camera so that you can transmit uh, the sound. Okay. Or you can change venue if you are in the okay. camera. Uh, uh, so is that better now? Yeah, but without your, uh, can you upload your slide? We couldn't see. Uh, okay. Just uh, okay. Can can you see the slide now? Uh, 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 now okay. Yeah. You okay. Can. Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, I will just continue from this slide. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. And uh, synchrotron has very wide applications in bioscience, medical research, and uh, materials and environmental science. And some researchers have used synchrotron-based technologies to study toxicity, just to use animal tissues or human tissues. They want to see how the, those uh, animal tissues have been affected, like in, in their proteins, lipids, those molecule components. But few people use single cell like to do the toxicity test. Just to, and so my work was the first to apply synchrotron-based technology to study the toxicity, but use a single single cell. So that's another reason that I want to use algae's algo cell because it's the single cell. And, and please look at those images. The first, uh, the first row is about the Canadian light source. Um, it provides synchrotron-based technologies in Canada. 
And the second row is about, um, it's about like uh, synchrotron-based FTIR spectral microscopy. It can be used to do in vivo tests. That means uh, it can see the single cell, but live cell. Uh, you can see the uh, right-hand one, uh, run right-hand side image. That is a sample holder and all the light has been covered. Just the, the light is focused on a single cell and it can extract the useful information from the individual cell. Then let's go to see some results. Uh, first is about cell density. The results showed the uh, species dependent effects. For example, CPCC12 is the most sensitive species and the E veritas is the least sensitive species. But for A superbus and E veritas, when they exposed it to environmentally relevant concentrations of triclosan, they show stimulated cell growth. That means their cell number increased, not decreased. Um, for the cell size, you still can see A superbus has the, like, the largest cell size changes. But for the other two species, CPCC243 and the CPCC12, they have the mild or almost no cell size changes. They are the smallest cell. And it also meets the species dependent effects. For photopigment variation, you can uh, see three species meet, uh, have a, a good dose response relationship. For, uh, they are chlor Qualcomm species, CPCC243 and CPCC12. And for the others, like uh, E. veritas and A. superbus, they also have stimulated chlorophyll pigment concentration when both uh, species are exposed to environmentally relevant concentrations. This results are consistent with the cell density. And for chlorophyll fluorescence, we uh, did a lot of tests but we found FVFM and QN are the two most sensitive species, uh, sensitive parameters. And then um, FVFM in indicate the effectiveness in photosynthesis system. And the QN is the non-photochemical -photo quenching. And the increase of both parameters indicate the, just the cell have the protection mechanism to protect the cells against the, the attack from the triclosan. But the inhibition in two parameters indicate, well, the photo damage from the triclosan. So you can see triclosan would attack the photosynthesis system and to affect the photosynthesis process. And also the results have species dependent effects like the CPCC243 is the most sensitive species to QN. And from, uh, synchrotron-based FTIR, we can see the molec uh, molecular changes. Like uh, we just uh, we choose uh, lipids, proteins, DNA, and uh, carbohydrates. And different species have different responses in uh, the molecular components. And in order to see some details, I use second derivative spectra, like just to take lipids and uh, proteins as an example. 300 to 2800 are indicate are the area to give information about saturated lipids. And you can see uh, CPCC12, A superbus, and E veritas are sensitive to the higher levels of triclosan exposure. And you can see the uh, spectra shape, intensity, and the spectral position change. And for chlorococcum species and E. veritas, when they exposed it to environmentally relevant concentrations, their saturate, their like their the intensity in saturated lipids increased. While for protein, we uh, use Mi1 to see the second structure changes. And we can get a qualita quantitative and a qualitative information from the spectra. And the results showed a CPCC uh, or four algal species, except for the CPCC243, or showed the sensitivity in pro uh, protein secondary structure. And then I used the PCA uh, principal component analysis 
to see the sensitivity difference among the species and different species have different sensitivity. Like from the figure, uh, you can see CPCC12 is the most sensitive species because they the responses have been separated according to different uh, concentrations. And also, um, chlorococcum is the less sensitive one. But for A. superbus and E. veritas, they are the least sensitive species. But according to uh, the previous results, then we can conclude that E. veritas is the least sensitive one. And this study just uh, uh, tell us different species have different sensitivity. And just under long-term triclosan exposure, which indicate long-term triclosan ex exposure can change algal community composition, which means uh, the long-term triclosan exposure may increase uh, the cell growth for some species, but inhibit some uh, the cell growth. And even though for the one species, different endpoints have different sensitivity. So in order to give a comprehensive evaluation, it's better to use multiple endpoints to compare. But those endpoints are different, but, uh, but sometimes they, they, they are related with each other because we get the information just from the one single cell, individual cell. We can see the correlation from the spectra and the other results. And the last one is the most important one is the environmentally relevant concentrations show different or multiple long-term effects such as inhibition, resilience, resistance, and stimulation. The stimulation one uh, needs to further like uh, attention because uh, it's the opposite from inhibition, but it, but it has a like wider effect just to like have in one environment has enough nitrogens or phosphorus, they may cause algal bloom or red tide. But the environmentally relevant concentrations, the, when the chemicals ex, just to have those very low concentrations, they may also cause the stimulation for the algal growth. So, uh, but the inner mechanism has not been studied. Then I think um, it needs further exploration about the hormesis phenomena. And that's our, what I'm uh, presenting. That's all about my presentation. Well, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Sai Ying. Uh, I, I would like to start a question that, uh, what, what can you um, do uh, okay. with the synchrotron? I mean, uh, rather than using the traditional uh, electron microscope, what, what mm -hmm. additional things you can see using the synchrotron? Uh, from, by, by using the FTIR? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, I can take FTIR as an example. Mm -hmm. Like, um, because it can measure the single cell and it can measure the live cells. So the information just um, is like more accurate because for, from the traditional light source, if you want to use the FTIR, all of the algae have to be just a, a free stride and all of the algae are dead. So there's a little difference just between the results. The second is about uh, what can we get from the results. We can get like the molecular components, some information about those molecules like lipids, proteins, DNA, and uh, carbohydrates. Well, there are some specific a wavelength that can give us information about those molecules. And also we can use second derivative spectra to see some details about those uh, like uh, uh, molecules. We, we also can see like the secondary structure changes of protein, like the alpha, alpha structure or helix structure. We can see the changes, the ratio changes of two structures and to see how the protein degraded. So it actually it can give a lot of information about the molecules, but it's the general information, not the specific one. If we can get the specific protein or lipids, we can do the specific analyze further. I see. There is a question from Dr. James Ben to you. 
Okay. Right? So, whether your data obtained from single cell or from cell culture with multiple cells? Uh, from a single cell, from cell culture. Okay. Um, actually, the uh, every time when I just measure one treatment, I will uh, take more than 10 cells. So, uh, but, but the spectra is from single cell, one cell, just one cell, but I will measure like more than 10 cells to get a, a average, the spectra average. Yeah. Okay. So Sayin demonstrate uh, one tips for scientists now, if you use really high tech machine, you can publish in good journal easily. So, and also this uh, synchrotron can tell us a lot of uh, 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 different parameters we seldom uh, able to measure in the, in the past. So uh, very, very nice work. Uh, uh, hello, Kenny, can I uh, ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, thanks, uh, Shaying, for a very interesting talk. And may I know uh, whether there are significant, uh, now if you are, if if you now now you have the tools to analyze at a single cell level, right? So are there are there any significant variations between individual cells? Uh, like the individual between individual cells and the biomass. Yeah. Individual cells between individual cells, the individual cell responses, because uh, this is a very important. Uh, actually a question in ecotoxicology, whether whether the individual uh, variations, okay, and what, uh, how should I say that? So, I mean, um, individual sensitivity right? mm -hmm. to, to, to the, to, to the uh, even the same concentration of, of, mm -hmm. a, of a same uh, compo uh, toxicant. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's a very interesting topic. And when we do the single cell analysis, uh, there is, of course, there is a difference just a, between like among cells. Uh, but the problem is if we, I use the, like the, uh, when the, the same treatment, like when a cell is exposed to a specific concentration, then when I measure the cells in this treatment, there is a little changes, but when I get the average spectra and I compare this spectra to the uh, another spectra, just from another treatment, that means okay. the cell exposed to another concentration, like uh, the results are different. So just in the same treatment, in, in, in the same treatment group, the, uh, the cells has difference, but compared to another treatment, the difference is just um, bigger. Okay. Well, yeah, and, and I think uh, when I do the quantitative analysis, I would use a reference, like I would choose the spectra area, uh, spectra area of MI2, that is the um, functional group of a protein. And then I would use a ratio, like use the uh, spectra area of lipid uh, to divide it by, by the spectral ratio of MI2 and to reduce spect uh, cell to cell difference. So we, we need to do something to re reduce cell to cell difference if we want to get the quantitative information. Mm -hmm. But if we want to uh, just to reduce the qualitative uh, difference, I think we may just control the cell circle. It's better to control the cell, cell, cell life circle and to make it in the same like mm -hmm. state, in the same phase. So yeah. why, why I ask this question is because no, uh, because we challenge the concept of EC50 or EC. Mm -hmm. now why 50% of things can die or, or can be responsive or why another 50% uh, can be still alive? You know? So we w want to see if there's individual sensitivity plays a significant role in defining so-called EC50, okay. mm -hmm. classical ecotoxicology. No, I, I think maybe single cell analysis may uh, provide this shed a light on this issue. Okay. Oh, thank you. That that's thank a lot yeah. to think about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, given the time limitation, uh, may I now uh, hand over to Professor Woodoffu?
to lead us uh, to have the final uh, question and answer and also a one table discussion. May I invite all the speakers of today uh, switch on your camera so that uh, we can have uh, uh, the one table discussion. Now uh, over to Professor Wu, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Now, everybody, um, this one day symposium has to highlight a wide range of impending problem on our marine environment in the coming decades. And some of the problems that we mentioned are actually eminent global problems, such as hypoxia, ocean desertification, emerging chemical concern, especially EDCs and LCMS, nanoplastics, antibiotics, etc. And some others are particularly relevant to our tropical and subtropical environment in the region, and such as Ciguatera and coral breaching and so on and so forth. At the same time, and a number of workers and also introduce novel technology and uh, or novel approaches to address or to solve some of these problems, such as the biosensor for pollution monitoring and the metagenomic approaches and for identifying ARGs and risk assessment, and then coral restoration and uh, eco engineering of seawall and so on and so forth. Now, what I suggest is that uh, we call on the panel members, uh, Professor Kenneth Learn and Professor G1 uh, uh, Yo, and then the Dr. Apple Jew, and then Dr. Henry He, and then John and Dr. Leo Chen to join us together for this and uh, panel discussion and lead the discussion. And of course, and all participants are welcome to throw in their ideas and in the discussion. And in view of this shortage of time, I suggest we actually primarily focus on two areas and in our discussion. The first question is that, what is the grand challenge of these um, the marine environmental issues in the uh, East Asia region, which is much more relevant and close to us? And the second is that uh, the state key level of marine pollution has considerable expertise and strength in marine pollution in our capacity as a the lead of the Regional Center of Excellence in Marine Pollution of PAMSI, in what way that we can share, help, and contribute to the RDs and their consortium so that we can have a better future. Now, the uh, topic is open for discussion. And I'd like to have your comments. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I start first. I, I still think uh, uh, those are common issues like eutrophication, hypoxia, still present the greatest challenge in, uh, in our region. Um, because we have a really high uh, density and population in coastal cities. And, uh, and also many of uh, countries in the region without the uh, financial and also the infrastructure support uh, to treat the wastewater to a more acceptable level. So I think they basically the organic pollution and also the nutrient, nu nutrients uh, discharge remain uh, one of the key challenges in the region. Uh, if you talk about um, uh, chemical pollution, they have impact but rather in a gradient, that means uh, uh, in, in the discharge location, you may have a, a more adverse effect. But once they reach out with dilution, the, the effect will be lessened. But on the contrary, if there is a eutrophication hypoxia, the impact area will be very huge and then will have a long lasting impact. I, I personally, I think uh, this is remain one of the biggest challenge uh, uh, we need to look at and tackle. Okay, another view. You guys are very shy. No? So how about the other panel member, Rajan? Um, yes, Professor Wu. Uh, Yes, what uh, Kenny says is correct. Uh, hypoxia, eutrophication is going to be the key. Uh, but also, I think we can't ignore um, the global 
change, uh, particularly changes in the seasonality, um, which is, uh, we can call as a climate change, but I think is even the regional uh, climate change, uh, heavy rain, heavy, you know, unusual weather pattern, these are all going to work with the hypoxia, is all going to work with the eutrophication, um, which, is, which is, I think, the impact of this interaction between the seasonal change with the local pollution or local, whatever the, the pollutant we have studied so far, is going to be in a different scenario. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be the same or it's going to be totally different. I think this, which the society wanted to know. If a heavy rain in southern China for, uh, for a particular year, what will be the impact on all the stresses we have measured is on their impacts. I think that, that that's, I think is something interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So how about Jen Wan? Oh, oh sorry, Henry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Professor, so, um, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, uh, Kenny and Rajan's um, the view on the current um, contamination issue, uh, but, um, in my view, uh, a, a, a more, perhaps a more profound and emergent issue would be the Fukushima nuclear water. Mm. That that's um, uh, even mm. compared to endocrine disruption or a hypoxia study, um, the potential uh, environmental impact or ecotoxicity of those nuclear nuclei on mm. on the ecosystem are, are actually under under study, so, so no one actually know a lot of uh, detail about what the consequence that these water, if, if these water with such a large amount being released into the, the ocean and what, what, what could be the consequence to the East Asia Sea. So, um, and the sample is very difficult to get, right? At, under the current circumstances. So we may think of, uh, strategy that to deal with this uh, potential problem. I, I don't know how, but, but th th that's really concern. And it's, there's uh, really a public concern as well, right? People are afraid of uh, consuming uh, seafood after the news been released that uh, the nuclear water might be uh, discharging directly into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't know, maybe um, um, some other panel member can share their idea. I think uh, I, I studied this issue um, uh, quite um, in details. I think uh, Southeast Asia and Hong Kong are pretty safe because the current won't uh, bring those uh, nuclear uh, pollutants down here. I think the, um, the impact area will be uh, Yellow Sea, Eastern Sea, Korea, and, and Japan themselves. And also the current will bring the pollutants all the way go to USA. So uh, then uh, um, these are the facts. Uh, so, uh, so we are quite lucky in uh, Southeast Asia. We, are, we have no problem because the China government, especially uh, uh, the, the Southern Oceanology Institutes have been monitoring this uh, since the incident. So, so far so good in our region. Uh, so, Professor Wu, please. Uh, in actual fact, uh, you are right, and I share the similar concern. And uh, when they announced this, and in fact, and uh, <clears throat> as what can they point out? If you just based on the hydrography, so basically the water <clears throat> and discharge from the Hiroshima, and they would sorry, and they would Fukushima, sorry. And then we then go around in Japan and go up. And then by the time we'll be pretty diluted. And then the most affected would be the sort of the northern part of China, Yellow Sea, and so on and so forth. And then the water, the current won't come down. But however, I'm, I got uh, fairly, I can't think of a better word, or pissed off. <laughs> and then the, because, and then the Japanese saying that it's not, uh, well, no, no problem, and same as the American. And then, uh, uh, in fact, they are, if you discharge so much, and then they said the dilution is the solution because I dilute it so much. And that, so in that case, you don't need any treatment at all if in their, in their, based on the way of thinking. 
And then, so at the several months ago, and we tried to use the artificial muscle, explore the possibility of using the artificial muscle that we developed to monitor the sort of the radioactivity because they actually take up uranium, cesium, and strontium. And then, so we are underway doing this with the, some of the colleagues in the city U. And then hopefully we can provide a monitoring device. And uh, but I'm not sure because due to the political situation, whether the American and Japanese will use it, use this, and they know about this, and but they refrain from doing this. In fact, and uh, when the sort of Fukushima incidents <clears throat> uh, occurred several years ago, I was serving on the uh, group of ex expert on marine pollution of the UN, and they hire a lot, hire away a lot of these facts from us. In fact, mm -hmm. but anyway, that's the side issue. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, uh, um, it's uh, Professor. Uh, it's uh, very good to know at least the technique you develop. Uh, the artificial muscle can be used in uh, monitoring this kind of uh, environmental uh, pollutants. Um, yeah, um, my um, uh, thinking uh, on the, I mean, on the two issues, uh, both two race, one is a uh, grand challenge, one is uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, state key lab, uh, marine pollution. Uh, for the um, first one, I think uh, you guys have uh, raised a lot of uh, um, Points, but for the second one, I think uh, this uh, meeting uh, with a lot of colleagues in uh, from uh, Southeast Asia uh, would be a very good uh, mode. Uh, would be a very good platform for us to build up some collaborations. Mm -hmm. And uh, from uh, today's talk, I know uh, a Stakey Lab uh, has a lot of expertise uh, and. Uh, to analyze a lot of uh, chemicals, uh, to do very comprehensive uh, toxicity tests. I think if we uh, can uh, do more of uh, this kind of meetings to, uh, to do, uh, to develop some large scale studies, we can contribute more to solve the problems in uh, Southeast Asia. So yeah. uh, I think this is a good beginning. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, and uh, I hope members still remember um, why we are best told with the title of the Regional Center of Excellence by PEMSI is that we talk to, they expect us to take the lead and then contribute and help each other out in the region of these and the 11 uh, member country. So I think we should sort of uh, pursue for that effort and then try to help each other out and then use our strength and then share with them. Say, for example, before that, we organized this uh, technical training workshop on EIA and things like that. So now, say, for example, just, just uh, for example, take examples, the things that we do, we are good at something like the coral restoration and then the eco shore and we can share that workshop with them so that they can follow and the same same path and then improve the environment in the other country, particularly in the uh, developing country. Yeah, and also related to this uh, uh, coral restoration. Uh, yeah. In a lot of places, uh, if we talk about coral restoration, uh, we need to study the uh, uh, gene flow, the source and sink of larvae, and also other organisms. When we talk about restoration, we have to consider this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, large scale uh, geographic areas, uh, populations in different places. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we can uh, build up this kind of co uh, uh, collaboration, we can do uh, a more practical, more meaningful restoration projects. Yeah. So. Yes, in fact, uh, I think that's a good idea. Say, say, take example, if you organize a workshop, regional training workshop, and for coral restoration, and for shore restoration, that will attract a lot of attention. And then this is also doable. And then the other thing is that the, the other uh, members of the state key lab, if they organize a training workshop on the chemical analysis of these emerging chemicals, which are difficult, and then we share with them the SOPs and things like that that will help them to jumpstart to tackle the problem and very quickly.
Yes, um, I, I I totally agree with um, what Professor Chu mentioned um, about restoration. We talk about connectivity. You know, uh, the sea so large, the dispersal of larvae. Where 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 do they go? Actually, where are our source of larvae? Where is the sink, etc. I think um, because today we talk about big picture, and I really appreciate this um, workshop opportunity so that we can you know lay out everything and discuss about um, our, our our plans in future. But if you ask my um, opinion, I think um, Hong Kong is really special because I always because especially for corals, I think it also applies. To other organisms in general because mm. you know hong kong is a very interesting place it's so highly developed highly urbanized but at the same time we have mm. so so amazing awesome, awesome uh, high bio, marine biodiversity so we can always make good use to our very unique environment context a uh, very extreme environment yeah. for example in terms of temperature hypoxia sediment everything's just happen at the same time in such a small place so by understanding um, these kind of impacts and study the organisms that survive in this environment um, to understand whether or not they're really that resilience and if they are then we understand the mechanisms we do comparative studies so that's why i really appreciate um uh, what professor chu just bring out whether or not we can strengthen collaboration across different countries you know these are very important for collaborative studies to you know try to see if there's any difference and the mechanism behind um yeah. but i think the very important is after we understand the mechanisms, molecular pathway, uh, the adaptation, very important is we have to bring our knowledge forward, you know, to really help in conservation in this phase of climate change. So uh, personally, I, 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 I love um, what um, uh, all, all the presentation I, I've listened, I think they're really awesome, like OISA, um, you know, hypoxia, like eco shoreline, these are, I think, a, a very frontline study and i think um it, it set a very good examples to others as well. so i think a workshop yeah. etc I, I really like that yeah yeah myself and contribute as well thank you yeah that that's good and how about uh, jin ling oh yes and um, so um because we, we actually talked about um part of us okay i talked a lot of uh, laboratory experiments right and the demonstration of those uh, hazardous things. Now, uh, I, what, what I'm curious about is, do we really see, okay, uh, do we really see an uh, epical, uh, ecologically relevant, uh, and those uh, hazardous uh, impacts really occurring in, 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 the, in the regional marine environment so that we can really tackle it uh, as a priority. Otherwise, we may just play a lot of uh, kitchen chemistry or whatever in in the laboratory. So, uh, yeah, th th this is my my just my uh, two cents. I, I think we really need to uh, think about the protection goal um, based uh, uh, investigation and future research to really target what has really been occurring in, yeah. in the environment. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I would like to invite uh, Daisy uh, uh, to to answer the second question. Uh, what what can we help uh, with the PMC and the the region's partners? Uh, thank you, Daisy. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for all the speakers. It was a very interesting day. Actually, the topics were very good. Um, yeah, in terms of how SKLMP can help the countries in the region, um, uh, as mentioned by Professor Wu, uh, SKLMP is one of PEMC's uh, regional centers for excellence. And as one of the regional centers of excellence, we actually um, hope that SKLMP can provide um, capacity building to most of our partners in the region, particularly the universities and even the local governments. But then again, of course, um, most of the universities and local governments in the region don't have the capacity. I mean, the, they don't have the technologies that SKLMP have. So we can take that in consideration in terms of um, possible collaboration and partnerships because most of them, um, most of the laboratories in the local governments and at least in the universities, 
it's not the same as what you have in the University of Hong Kong. So maybe we can take that as a consideration. And then currently, um, we are actually developing the um, PEMC roadmap and the SDSC implementation plan for 2023 to 2028. So in that plan, we are actually identifying the priority programs or priority management programs in the region. So that covers a range of issues like climate change, marine pollution, habitat protection, and uh, food security, fisheries management. So we can actually identify what are, um, in developing the plan, we identify the issues and what are the needs in the region. So in developing that, maybe we can also consult with SKLMP on what are some of the aspects in the plan that you can help uh, in implementing it and how, uh, how we can um, share your knowledge and expertise to countries in the, yeah, at least in the PEMC countries. So I think we can put that forward. Um, the development of the plan is, will start, um, yeah, it's actually starting. So in putting that together, we will take that into consideration. So hopefully it's all right. If in the next few months, we will also um, uh, communicate with SKLMP. Uh, probably through Professor Wu or Professor Kenny. And yeah, uh, and yeah, while going through that, we'll be able to identify uh, what areas um, SKLMP can contribute to. So yeah, and then yeah, part of it, of course, in the plan is um, we also have the capacity development plan. So I think that's where SKLMP can particularly um, help and also maybe in terms of uh, identifying targeted research for marine pollution assessment. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday and this morning, um, there were um, uh, possible opportunities for collaboration on research like uh, on Seguatera, Seguatera research and uh, I think some, uh, what's the other, there are other opportunities for possible collaboration. So we can actually do that in, in the future. And we all, I also noted that this um, symposium and the training workshop um, yesterday is very, was very helpful actually. Um, it, it was a good way of sharing your expertise and it also provides opportunities for possible networking. So as you mentioned, we can also organize um, similar uh, workshops in the future, but maybe more targeted or more subject specific. Like if we do microplastics, then we can organize one on microplastics, one on coral restoration. And then we can target um, specific participants who would benefit for those um, types of workshops and yeah, seminars. And also we take note that there are also opportunities for um, like uh, uh, universities can, uh, can send samples to the University of Hong Kong for, for um, cross comparison among labs and all that. So we take note of all those opportunities and we can uh, have a future communication to to um, build this with SKLMP and uh, link, link you with um, our PEMC network of learning centers and the PEMC network of local governments. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I, hope, I think uh, that's a, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And then because the sort of the <clears throat> development is both ways, and then so we can offer something, but the most important thing is the PEMC to identify what's the thing that you need uh, most urgently. And then as you said, and then you, I don't think there's any problem if you send somebody to come to Hong Kong or then the, the sort of a failure with certain laboratory for a certain time, because we did this several times before. And I remember PEMC actually sponsor a couple of people to learn the artificial muscle techniques. Yes. And, 
when I was in Hong Kong, you they they attach with us for three months and something like that. And then the other thing is something like the toxicology is one of the maybe one of the area because something like I if I remember correctly in the region and there there's uh, no sort of self developed or or, or tailor made and what are the objective and that's one thing which is important and also the toxicity tests and that kind of thing and that may be a possibility. And uh, but uh, after this uh, symposium, probably a PEMC would have a much better understanding on the current uh, expertise of the Stakey Laboratory. And then on, I suppose, and uh, uh, Kenny as the director of the uh, uh, Stakey Lab would be more than willing to help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Professor Kenny. So we will uh, communicate with you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I would also like to introduce to you our uh, uh, Dr. Liu Chen, our associate director. Yeah. He, he is expert on uh, the coral ecology, um, uh, coral reef survey, yeah. as well as secret terror alcohol toxin survey. Maybe uh, Liu can say a few words, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I think, think we, we need we all need to say our uh, 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 because I think. Udolf asked us to organize this NG training workshop at symposia. At the beginning, we find there's a lot of documents to prepare, right, Udolf? So I think Udolf is consistently, I think, one stage he left to participate in NG from the very beginning. But I think only we have the expertise to make it happen today. So, yeah. so in the past 15 years, years I think several marine environmental research and, and innovative technology, technology have been developed under the uh, leadership of Rudolf. No matter, no matter Rudolf in, in, in CTU, CTU, Hong Kong, you and you exchange mentioned that Rudolf, Rudolf is, is always our leader or our teacher. So, so, so I think in the, in the next stage, stage I think the, also, also the China, China government already uh, concerned, concerned about this. How, how we can develop all, all these SOPs yeah. into an international standard of, of scientific method. method. They, they are pushing us yeah. to do this. Including, including the Chinese Academy of Science, Science they already asked us, us to develop this kind of uh, SOP, for example, artificial muscle, muscle right? right? It's a very good example for brutal monitoring. And, and, and also, I think they should mention that the inter-country Sample comparator, but, but but those research, research is based, based on international standardization methods. So 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 I, I already uh, worked work with the Chinese Academy of Science and, and, and also I think uh, WestPac to develop, develop underwater habitat mapping, and and also our chairman also mentioned that coral health monitoring, coral restoration. We 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 also can develop different kinds. SOP at the beginning, but eventually develop into international standard. Also for the benefit of not actually centering everyone using different methods. So it's very hard to compare the, the, the results. So I think it's also very important. And, 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 and also I think uh, we are, uh, Kenny asked us to, uh, to establish the research training center uh, for the UNESCO. So, so we, we think our uh, research, collaboration, together, together with training, is yeah. very important. So, so, so in the future, we will develop the RTRC with UNESCO. UNESCO. And, and also, also the Chinese, Chinese Academy of Science, they, they propose to, to, to establish a joint laboratory for yeah. environmental yeah. ISO. So, so I think maybe Pauline Rudolph can, can, can yeah. help and, and take the lead for, for, yes, for yes. this initiative. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, we, we apply the ECF uh, uh, to organize an uh, uh, ISO meeting for environmental methodologies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, can I can report to all of you. you. Thank yeah. you. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Very good. And in particular, Leo has a wealth of experience in knowledge transfer and that sort of thing, but can also help and with uh, the other PEMC members. Yeah. But uh, in view of the time, I was asked to stop at 5 30 otherwise i got killed or get the blow on the head <laughs> so maybe i can start so i i, I should uh, stop here but uh, again uh, thanks very much 
for all the part or your contribution. And I hope that you will continue to support and contribute to the State Key Laboratory and the PAMC Region Center of Excellence in the years to come. And that relies on uh, the leadership of Ken Eve and Leo. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I, I would okay. also like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, for their time and effort and sharing uh, of the uh, latest discovery. I especially want to thank Sai uh, uh, and also Phoebe and Grace uh, for organizing this event. Uh, uh, they, they did lots of hard work uh, yeah. for the event. I also thank Daisy for coordinating with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, goodbye. Okay, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.